we're going back to talking about pawn moves, guys, because you can't really exhaust such a large topic in chess in just a video or two. Plus, I was inspired by seeing this issue come up in one of my students' games and then also in some old classic games that I was studying and kind of surprised that even um, very top players from the past generations were doing kind of strange things with their pawns. So let's get into our first example. This was a game from students of mine and he's playing black and it is going quite well for him. It's a Carlsbad pawn structure, you know, these pawns versus these pawns. So both sides have pawn chains. It's definitely one of the um, important pawn structures in chess that you want to know about. So black is a very comfortable version of this position. White just went knight d2, and black decides to make a big pawn move f5. So what do you think about this move? Um, is it too weakening or is it just right? Actually, guys, it is a committal move. Moves like that, they uh, can potentially really weaken a center square like e5. So you do need to be careful about it. But I think for this position, it's actually quite appropriate because uh, you have a knight that's controlling e5, so this knight cannot easily get back in here. And um, yeah, it's actually worth it to give more support to your knight on e4. So while you don't have to play this move, I mean, you could almost just pass and your position will still be fine. Um, you know, if you want, I mean, you could even move your knight back to this center square to avoid the trade. It seems perfectly reasonable. But really, I do like this pawn move and I think it's justified. So white decides to take the knight. Don't really love that decision because it gives black a very obvious recapture. Um, advancing up the board, opening up the file for the rook. And of course, I do really like black's position here. So here we go. B7 pawn is attacked. So let's just go and counterattack on their knight. Right, guys? What do you think about that? Well... If you're a little bit suspicious of that pawn move, you're on the right track. Because unlike f5, this move has a really big effect on another pawn. And that is going to be a permanent effect, right? You have to take that into account. Uh, because the attack on the knight is temporary. But the effect on the pawn is permanent, right? So is it worth it making such a radical pawn move when you have other ways to guard this pawn? So I think it's not. It's the kind of move that, you know, by the way, even if your position is completely fine, you know, because black overall has such a nice position that he can even withstand this weakening pawn move. But even so, it gives white something to hope for and some potential counterplay down the line. So, of course, my instincts would go more towards a move like knight f6, laterally defending the pawn with the queen and... If they go in with knight to c5, you can just play rook f7. And this pawn is pretty easily guarded by the pieces that are actually quite far away. Um, you will also want to bring your rook over here and obviously initiate some kind of play on the king side where all of your pieces are gathered. And you also have the move rook b8. It's actually the computer's favorite. It's a bit more subtle than knight f6, but same idea. You're not looking for pawn commitments. I think we're making it actually by not going knight here, making it a little harder for white to have any ideas with their f pawn to try to fight back on the king side. So that's really the idea of rook b8 compared to knight f6. But those are subtle differences. I think the main thing is to realize like now is not the moment to go with this very committal pawn move. So let's see just a few moves how it went. Uh, the knight went, well, it could actually go back to c3. It went to c5. And, well, obviously, you don't really want to trade and then just have your c pawn exposed. So black decides to go this way because they're thinking um, that looks like a nice square for the knight. Okay, I mean, again, black's position is still very good. It's just a question of whether this was the optimal strategy. 
And white pulls the queen back in order to be able to have pawn to b3. And yeah, here black goes a little bit overboard uh, with the attack. I mean, they should use their rook and do a little bit of defense on the c6 pawn. Instead, they kind of uh, get ready for their kingside attack and knight e6 happens. And, you know, this is how it often goes in games. Um, you create a weakness. It's still not the end of the world, but the course of the game shows that it's a problem, right? So now we have, we definitely have a problem with this pawn. Perhaps we should have played rook c8. I mean, not, not really how you want to put the rook from the open file, right? Um, but maybe that's what you got to do to guard it. Black played here and white just took the pawn. So the weakness collapsed. By the way, I think Black had a, actually a chance to win the game um, if they would have played the tricky move Rook C8. Now, on a practical level, I think this move is a great chance to win the game because a lot of people will not enjoy the idea of sacrificing the Queen for the Rook and Knight, but that's actually what they have to do. It's their only option because otherwise if they take this Knight, well... You might be tempted by taking the rook and thinking that you're going to have like some kind of a checkmate like that. But unfortunately, rook takes rook is not a check and it allows white to check. So the best way to do it is this beautiful queen sack. And I think your chances of winning with this idea would have been quite good in a uh, certainly an online game. Right. So it's a pretty cool checkmate was definitely worth trying. Um, would white have noticed that and had the courage to sacrifice their queen um, as their best option? I don't know. But apparently this was the best option for white, although I'm not really sure if white can win this position. They have rook, knight, and pawn for the queen, but it's still a game. Anyway, what is the point, guys? The point is that do not make these unnecessary big pawn commitments, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if, if the position can be handled otherwise, right? That's the thing. I mean, this is very much optional, not required. So why even give your opponent any hope with regards to having a target on the C file? All right. So that was, you know, let's say the amateur level. Let's go to some games um, where you're having like top level players play. This is the game between uh, Georgi Borisenko playing white and Vasily Smyslov, the seventh world champion, playing black. And we have a locked up structure in the center. If you guess that this came from a Nimzo Indian defense, you would be right. It's quite typical for a Nimzo. And white decides now is the time to get aggressive with this pawn move. Okay, guys, I mean, maybe it's good, but at least you need to think uh, maybe twice or three or four times before you play that move because it does weaken some squares in your position, namely these two, right? And black does have knights that can try to get to those squares. So in reality, the correct strategy here is to play it slowly and try to focus on improving your position there's a pretty cool rook move right here because the rook can enter the game by the second rank at some point. And there could even be a nice maneuver of this knight, which is no good on b3, from a1 to c2. And you might think he's going this way. Well, maybe, but he probably is going to go this way into the center and to the king side. And then... You know, your ideas of playing on the king side with your g-pawn are quite viable. So, you know, in general, if you can improve your position more with these sort of non-committal moves like rook a2, well, you would prefer that than, you know, leaving your position um, unimproved and kind of rushing in with a move like g4 that you just cannot take back, right? So black plays knight of fate, very logical, you can see where that knight is going. And I mean, I'm sure that white didn't miss that idea, um, but he just thought that he could control the F4 square. 
Okay, so that he brought in his queen, so he's thinking, okay, this isn't really a problem because black can't put the knight here. There are positions where someone can sack a pawn just to get rid of this bishop, which is white's better bishop, but this isn't really the right moment for this kind of sacrifice because white, you know, will simply take the pawn and just be up a pawn. Um, but in some other kinds of positions, that could be an idea. So what should black have played here? Actually, black managed to misplay this position pretty quickly and white strategy was justified. But I'm going to show you a very cool idea the computer brought up here that I think um, really suits this position well. And the move is h5 for black. So what is that move about? Obviously, you can't take it because then the other knight comes in and gets into the outpost. But the idea is actually this move h4. So you want to kick the queen out in order to get that dark square. Makes a lot of sense. It's very difficult to deal with. I mean, if they go g5, you could actually go h4, tempo. And then your knight gets into h5 and f4. And that would be a disaster for white, you know, showing why you can't just rush in with weakening pawn moves. So white could go h3, but at least one simple approach here, black has various ways to play, but let's say it's h4 and then just knight h7. So now this knight has found a nice square. And, well, I think you can see that white strategy has failed on the king side. The pawns are blockaded. The knights are getting great squares. I know bishops versus knights has been one of our topics recently. And this is one of those cases where the knights are going to successfully deal with the bishops because they're going to have essentially like outpost squares where they're not going to be able to be removed by pawns, right? So h5 was a very uh, cool move, I think, that the computer was thinking about. Instead, he unfortunately failed to kind of establish a blockade with his knights on the king side. So he played here and then tried to go for this. Of course, white doesn't even have to trade. Um, and if you trade, well, you're kind of helping white's pawn structure, so it's not super desirable. He seemed to realize that because then he like moved the queen back. But you can see that black's play is very hesitant, right? Sort of back and forth, not really clear what he's doing. And g5, right before the knight arrives here, pushing back the queen. And this knight is getting improved in this nice maneuver. And right here, white's already doing great. Actually, it was an awesome maneuver from b3 to a1 to c2 to G e1 and g2. I mean, all across the board. And the knight is so much better because now you're controlling that square. Black can never get in. And you're just going to win the game with um, an advance of the pawn. So now the strategy works because black's knights were not able to establish themselves on any outposts on the king side. And um, and now they're just going to get pushed back. So, you know, the idea of moving the G-pawn, certainly not terrible, you know, provided like Black's knights are not going to get outposts. So here we go. I'll just show you quickly how it went. Um, yeah, he didn't even bother defending this pawn. So White is attacking on the king side. All of his pieces are there. Makes a lot of sense. And, okay, white did not want the repetition. He actually gave away a few pawns. But black's queen is nearly trapped here. Still trapped. And what was that? Knight h4. Oh, okay, the attack on this queen. But here we go. White wound up with an extra piece and converted pretty quickly. So... Main point in this game, guys, is, of course, the move g4. A little bit too early and super, super committal. So be careful about playing moves that are leaving, like, very weak squares in the position that your opponent can use. All right. Our next example was actually from the game of Mikhail Botvinnik. And this is a player that I studied a lot when I was a kid. 
I uh, enjoyed his book of best games and yeah, learns a lot from him. He play, he's playing Vasily Smyslov and um, he's not really playing a very aggressive opening against Smyslov's King's Indian. And here he decides to trade, which I don't know, it's a bit of a weird decision, right? Because like you're trading that pawn for that pawn, trading off some of your space. So I'm already kind of not sure about that. And then he just makes a pawn move, which I'm just so shocked by. You know, when I see it, it's like E4. How, how much uglier does it get than that, guys? Um, look, I know we don't really have an advantage as white. And I mean, the only reason I can really think of for this move is like, you must be very afraid of black pushing the pawn there. I mean, if you're so afraid of it, Put the queen on c2 or something. You know, get ready to put a rook on d1. Maybe a knight to d5, right? Just play that central strategy. Don't be so radical as to close up that bishop. Or you can even castle. Like, even if they do go e4, okay, then you'll play queen c2 and attack the pawn. Like, life's not over. It's not like, you know, they're getting in here just yet. I mean, they'd like to, but it's not that easy because this pawn is hanging. So... Um, this pawn move, yeah, let's talk about it. All the disadvantages of it. I mean, it really weakens that that square in the center. Could be relevant. Kind of closes up your bishop too. I mean, making your pieces bad like that is pretty big. So, um, yeah, you know, be careful, guys. You know, your bishop is beautiful. Putting a pawn in his way like that is not going to be an easy problem to fix. So black can already basically go with ideas like h4 or even on the other side of the board b5 there's some cool ideas over here the point is it's not even a pawn sack by the way all of this is possible because the bishop is closed so if you take take and try to win a pawn well you're gonna discover that your pieces are gonna start to hang over here they rely on each other a little too much uh Sometimes codependency is a bad thing in chess. So lots of nice ideas for black. He played knight h7, a reasonable move, and then h4. So already you can see how black is like probing the weaknesses. He wants to provoke white into like, let's say, playing some ugly move like that, right? Giving up these dark squares on the king side. Um, or he wants to at least get that trade and force white to capture away from the center, weakening the king. So I'm just going to show you guys um, how things went. Not a deep analysis, but just to show you the effect of the pawn structure on this game. Not sure why black didn't just capture immediately, because that was clearly their idea. They decide to... You know, throw in um, a generally useful pawn move, restricting the knight. And white's best chance here was actually to use this opportunity to go f4. And try to get a completely different pawn structure. With the idea that if black takes this pawn, you're like moving forward and at least you're creating some kind of space. And you'll, you should be able to get that pawn back in the future. And if they take this way, well, it looks dangerous on the diagonal, but everything is holding together in this position. And as long as it holds together, then actually your center is pretty nice. So white definitely should have used this chance to, you know, just do something different because what they got in the game with this move, I mean, the position is objectively still not so bad for white, at least according to the computer. But I think from a practical playing perspective, it's already got the outlines of something quite unpleasant. I mean, the king is weaker because of the removal of the F pawn. This bishop is still terrible. Like the knights are not impressive at all. They're getting completely restricted by these pawns. Um, plus black, I mean, has all of these squares they can dance around on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how how this can like appear close to equal to the computer when I think it's just so much easier to play as black. And that's what the game demonstrated. You know, black played here, started playing um, on the queen side and brought out their queen. 
Now White's best move was completely unobvious to hold the balance. They needed to just sacrifice this pawn like this and just bring out their knight to a more active position. And the computer says this is not too bad for a white who has a decent amount of centralization. And of course, black, you know, has pieces that are not so perfect either. So, well, that's not such a simple thing to do, right? So Botvinnik played rook c1, which is basically an indirect way to guard the pawn since um, if you take it, there's going to be a discovery on the queen and then the knight can get in with a fork. But this one move was already like enough to just give the initiative over to black because I guess the problem with this move is that it doesn't really try to improve a piece. And there's a lot of pieces in white's position that need improvement. So it is different from the move, you know, knight c1, which was trying to improve this knight. So black goes here and winds up putting a knight here. Yeah, pawn structure wise, I mean, things are just not that great for white. Just too many, too many weak squares, right? Like this d4 square also is going to be weak for the rest of the game. So white is trying to like trade pieces. Black is like, yeah, if you would like to make the trade of queens, I'll get more advantages like opening up my rook and getting a stronger pawn. So that didn't work out for white. So easy for black to just play moves, yeah? It's easy to play good moves when your pawn structure is better. So it takes this file, decides to improve the situation on the queen side even more. So that square is in fact something that, you know, white has to watch out for. And, I mean, I think the final piece of the puzzle is to bring this knight into the game. Poor white. I mean, I rarely have seen Botvinnik in such a bad position, strategically, as he is here. It's just like, how much worse can it get? You have a knight on the back of the board. Like, nothing can move. Weak king. Terrible bishop. They have an outpost here. I mean, now you're, like, stuck defending the e4 pawn so bad right and really it's like coming out of that terrible decision to like play four and just kill that bishop anyway guys um yeah black is almost putting white into zigzag i mean what can even move in white's position like so many weak squares over here and um that's why he felt so desperate that he actually gave up his dark squared bishop, which is like a very, very sad thing to have to do in this position. Black could have captured it, even with the bishop, actually, because after queen takes, there's like rook d2. Anyway, um, something's happened in this game that white actually had a chance to survive from like a horrible position that is like minus three, minus four at this point. But I think you get the idea of like how harmful the move e4 was um, for white. So yeah, I was a little, you know, surprised to see that even in games of like really experienced, um, you know, world-class players, we can find examples of unfortunate pawn moves. So it's something that really um, impacts players of all levels, guys. And the way I would think about it is think of pawn moves as those big life decisions, right? Like where you live, where you work, who you marry, all these like very big decisions that it's very hard to um, to fix, you know, <laughs> once you, you've already made a commitment, right? So the same thing with pawn moves. It's, um, it's a commitment, it's gonna be a long-term commitment and it's gonna be hard to fix it if it goes wrong. So before you move a pawn, think carefully.